to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the people of Israel, God said, Stand in the way and see, and ask for the old path where the good way is, and there you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not. Jeremiah 6, verse number 16. Today we're thinking about going back to the Bible, the passionate plea to go back to the old way, back to the Bible, and live according to God's will. We're so glad that you joined us for our broadcast today. And friend, we're going to think today about what it really means to put all preconceived ideas behind us and just go back to the pure Christianity of the Bible. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. The Scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Man doesn't have the ability to get himself to heaven. He can't think up his own way of salvation instead. We need to listen to God and go back to the Bible to understand His will. You see, this idea of going back to the Bible, it's such a pertinent idea all throughout Scripture. Hosea 4 verse 6, God said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. During some dark days in Israel's history, they weren't seeking God like they should have. And then as you come to the New Testament, The plea of going back to the Bible is such a vibrant plea. Acts 17 verse 11, the Bible says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, those in Berea, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What made people noble in the Bible? When they heard something, that was presented as a message from God, they didn't immediately buy into that. They searched the scriptures to see if that were true. 
Friend, that's our appeal today. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. And so rather than just believe everything we're told, rather than do what is popular or what other people are doing, let's go back to the Bible and do what God says. But what does it really mean? If we go back to the Bible, friend, going back to the Bible in several areas is such a powerful idea, and we want to illustrate that today. Going back to the Bible means we go back to God's Word to learn about Bible authority. How does God expect me to take His Word? Does God mean what he says? Is there wiggle room there? How does God expect us to relate to his divine authority? And friend, here's what the Bible teaches. Colossians 3 verse 17. Paul said, whatever you do, listen to the all-inclusive nature of it. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, friend, to do something in the name of Jesus does not mean that you can just do whatever you want, throw your hands up in the air and say, in Jesus' name, and that makes it okay. We learn from the Bible what it means. Acts 4, verse 7, they asked Peter and John, by what power or by what name have you done these things? To do something in someone's name means you do it by their authority, their power, and with their blessing. Now let's apply that idea to Colossians 3.17. Paul said, whatever you do, and then he gets more inclusive, in word or in deed, do all in the name of, which we've already seen, means by the authority of Jesus Christ. In matters of religion, how the Christian lives his life, how we worship, how we're saved, we're to do everything by Christ's authority. And that's exactly what Jesus taught us, right? Do you remember Matthew 28, verse number 18? Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he said, you go make disciples of all nations. If Jesus has all authority, how much else is left for me and for you and for religious leaders today? Well, you can't have more than all, and Jesus has all authority. This is why the Scripture teaches us not to go beyond what is written. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. This is why the Bible tells us not to add to or take away from the Word of God. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. We're simply to, to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, 11, to preach and teach God's Word, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. And friend, there are two very powerful questions that every person who's trying to please God and accept his authority must ask. Both of these are found in Scripture. In Jeremiah 37, verse 17, an evil king asked a great question. Is there any word from the Lord? And in Romans 4, verse 3, Paul repeats that same sentiment, what does the Scripture say? And so, my friend, as we think about going back to the Bible for authority, we're asking, what's God's Word say? Has God spoken on this issue? What does the Bible teach us on this matter? And when we find that, God wants us to do exactly what He says. Then let's think about Bible authority, or excuse me, the idea of going back to the Bible for a second area. Let's go back to the Bible for worship that is pleasing to Almighty God. God is worthy of our worship. The scripture clearly teaches that idea. Psalm 96, the psalmist would say, come let us worship and bow down before the Lord our maker. Jesus would say, God, we shall worship, the, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Matthew 4, verses 9 and 10. But how does God want to be worshiped? You remember John chapter 4? 
Jesus is discussing with a Samaritan woman, and she's got a question about worship. Uh, you Jews say we ought to worship in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worship over here on Mount Gerizim. Where is the right place? And Jesus basically doesn't address the place, but he says this. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Friend, when we think about correct worship, the kind of worship that God's asked for, God wants to be worshiped in spirit and in truth. Now, what does that mean? To worship God in spirit means that we worship him with our whole soul, spirit, mind, and, and being. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, I'll sing with the spirit and I'll sing with the understanding. We ought to be engaged. We ought to be thinking about it. Our, uh, we ought to give everything we have, our whole being to God. But then think about this as well. That must be governed by truth. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship in truth? Well, maybe we back up and we ask uh, another question first. What is truth? John 18, verse 36, Pilate asked that question, and our Lord had already answered it. In his prayer to the Father, in John 17, verse 17, Jesus said to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Listen now. Your word is truth. And so if we're to worship God according to truth, and God's word is truth, then we're to worship the way God wants to be worshipped in the Bible. Here's somehow, sometimes how we miss the boat on this. We think that worship is about man. It's about making us feel good. It's about making everybody happy. It's about doing what's popular and will draw people in. We've got it completely backwards. God is the audience in our worship. We're the participants. Our worship is given to God, and we need to give it in such a way that he's asked for and that is acceptable to Almighty God, Revelation 12, or excuse me, Hebrews 12, verses 28 through 30. And so it's not about me. It's about how does God ask to be worshipped. And friend, when you see in the Bible, God's worship, especially in the New Testament, for Christians today, we worship God by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 17. We worship and honor God collectively as a church when we gather on the first day of every week to give, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and to partake of the Lord's Supper, Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. The, the, the preaching of God's word, the gospel message definitely honors and glorifies God, Romans 1, 16, and then, of course, as Christians, when we pray, our prayers that magnify and honor God through the name of Jesus with the right heart and spirit, that, that's one of the ways that we worship and we thank and we honor Almighty God. And so not, not only do we want to go back to the Bible to learn about authority and to learn about worship, friend, as we think about going back to the Bible, let's consider another idea today. We desperately need to go back to the Bible as it relates to morality. What does God want us to do on a moral level? And, and moral, the word moral describes character, uh, right character, good character, right living. And so when we talk about morality, we're talking about the type of living and character and actions that God approves of. I guess with every society, I possibly say this, but there's a lot of things in society today that are very immoral. How does God expect us to live as it relates to the Christian life? And friend, I want you to see what the Bible says on this idea as it relates to things like alcohol. How does God want us to live? Here's what the Bible says. Do not be drunken with wine, wherein is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Realize that wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, Whoever's led astray by it is not wrought wise. Realize as it relates to morality that God wants one man and one woman in marriage and for that to last for life. Genesis 2.24, for this reason, 
A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Realize that, that God joins that, Matthew 19, verses 1 through 9. That, that, that divorce is not a part of that. The only scriptural reason for divorce is fornication, Matthew 19, 9. And that, that God wants people, when they're married, to make it work. That's a, a lifelong, till death do us part commitment, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And so as it, as it relates to morality, God wants us to live a holy life. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. 1 Peter 1, verse number 15, God says, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And so while while none of us are saying that we are perfect, that we never make a mistake, that we're as holy as God, that's not the idea. We do try to live up to God's moral standard. All the immorality, all the adultery and fornication and, and, and sexual immorality that exists today, that's not what God wants. Here's what God wants. Marriage is honorable. The bed between a husband and a woman in marriage is undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, as it relates to morality. Friend, I need to be very careful about my speech. Colossians 3, verse 8, let, let no filthy communication come out of your mouth. Ephesians 4, verse 29, we're not to have coarse jesting or unclean jokes or things like that. that that's not the way a Christian ought to live. Our speech, our talk, uh, our dress, our manner of life. We want to go back to the Bible. Instead of, letting, instead of letting society dictate that, instead of letting leaders of today tell us what may or may not be okay, friend, if I'm trying to please God and live a life that honors Him, let's go back to the Bible and ask, what does God want as it relates to these matters? How does God expect me as his child to live. And then my friend, as we think about going back to the Bible, I want you to consider uh, this idea with me for just a moment. Let's go back to the Bible as it relates to the church you read about in the Bible. We live in a world where you can find a religious group on every street corner doing different things, teaching different ideas. It's like ice cream, whatever flavor just kind of makes you happy. Is that what God wants as it relates to the church? You see, my friend, Jesus didn't teach that. In fact, Jesus clearly taught that he built his church and he wants all people to be unified as one in that church. Listen, listen to Matthew 16. Jesus has asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so some said Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. Jesus said, But who do you? You've been with me a little closer. Who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, You're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Peter had seen that proof after proof. He knew he wasn't just some other man. And Jesus said to Simon, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood's not revealed this to you. People didn't tell you this, but my Father who art in heaven. And then he said this, I say to you that you're Peter. You're a small pebble, but on this rock, and the word means bedrock foundation, on this rock, I'll build my church. Now, what are we talking about this rock? The rock was the statement Peter made on the fact, the bedrock truth, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Friend, when you think about the church of the Bible, I want you to ask a, and answer a couple of questions from, with me from this verse. Who built the church? Well, Jesus said, I will build my church. And so the church we read about in the Bible is one that Jesus built. Acts 20 verse 28, he purchased that church with his own blood. No man could build it and pay the price for it because it was Jesus' sinless, precious blood that purchased it. 
Well, let's ask another question from the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 18. How many churches did Jesus promise to build? Does it read like this? Upon these rocks, I will build my churches? Is that what it says? No. Jesus said, upon this rock singular, I will build my church singular. It's never God's intention for all the division, all the denominationalism, all the naming religious groups after different men or movements or religious acts. That, that's not God's plan. Jesus said, I will build my church. He built it. It's singular. And friend, realize this. Who does the church belong to? Well, notice again. Jesus said, I will build my church. Church doesn't belong to me. Church doesn't belong to you. The church doesn't belong to some great reformer. A man's name ought to be, not be up there because the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It's singular. It's unique. It's the place of the saved. Acts 2 verse 47, those who obeyed God's word, God added them to his church when they submitted to God's terms of salvation, which included for people to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Then God added them to his church. Acts chapter 2 verses 38 through 47. And so as we think about the church, it's a lot different than what we see in our world today. But then, my friend, let's think about a couple of other ideas. Let's go back to the Bible as it relates to Christian living. Friend, how does God expect his followers to live every day? How should a Christian look? Well, a Christian ought to be identifiable by the way he lives his life, by the way he talks, by the way he acts, by his dedication to the Lord. And so when we talk about Christian living, this is a big idea. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What's unique about Christianity? It is a dedication, a desire to follow the Lord, and a, a denial of self and a commitment every day to give myself to the Lord. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 kind of encapsulates that idea. Paul said to the Christians in Rome, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, Paul, what do you mean by that? Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like the world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Based on everything God has done for us, we strive to be transformed, to think, to act, to view the world differently, to live differently in every way. Think about what Paul said about his commitment. We talk about daily Christian living. What a beautiful idea this is. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you hear the words of Romans 12, 1? Be a living sacrifice. Paul said, I crucified myself with Christ. The old man died. The old way of life died. It died with Jesus. When I obeyed the gospel, I put it on the cross as it were. And now I'm living every day for the Lord. And then let's think about one final idea as it relates to going back to the Bible. Friend, we need to go back to the Bible as it relates to understanding sin, the terrible, destructive nature of sin and its consequences. Someone once said, it says a lot about our society today when we describe a really good dessert as sinful. You know, if we really understood what that meant. That's not a word we'd use to describe something really good. Ezekiel 18.4 puts it this way. The soul who sins will surely die. The Bible clearly teaches the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23. Sin separates a man and a woman from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 says the Lord's 
ears not heavy that he cannot hear, his arms not short that he cannot save. Your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin is destructive in that it causes spiritual death. It, it, it separates a man from God, and those who live in sin and die in sin will be lost in a devil's hell for eternity. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. Now the good news. Jesus came to deal with the sin problem, and if we're willing to give up and follow him, we can be rid of the sin problem through his blood. The Bible says in Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21, you'll call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Jesus, when he made that ultimate sacrifice, Matthew 26, 28, he said, representative of his blood, this is my blood of the new covenant that was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And when a person obeys the gospel, He's washed in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. And so God's made salvation available. Let's go back to the Bible and just simply do what God says to be saved. Here's what we find in the New Testament. When people heard the gospel, they were willing to believe Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm he, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed that truth, they were willing to make a change in their life. Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. They were willing to turn from sin and turn to God. They acknowledge with their mouth Jesus as the Savior. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, verse 10. And then they did what Jesus said to be saved. He that believes and is baptized, will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Acts 2 verse 38, they were told to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And so, my friend, we hope today that this will motivate and encourage us to go back to the Bible. And if you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that today. If we can help you, contact us and let us know and join us next time as we study more from the gospel of Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.